Michael Nichols. I'm a certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assessed here in Bellingham, Washington. I'm going to answer some questions today that were uh, put forth to me by Wyatt as part of his school project. The first is, what is positive reinforcement based dog training? Well, one way to think about positive reinforcement dog training is that we're always looking for what we can reward and reinforce rather than looking for what we can punish uh, or diminish. So rather than following Rudy around this room that's got lots of stuff in it, I've got a stereo and a television and a crate and a lamp and beds and all this, not books and all this stuff. Instead of following him around saying, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that, or punishing him for doing those things, I tell him, yes, lay down, relax, hang out with me, and I reinforce and reward this behavior by telling him, good dog, and praising him and giving him affection and maybe giving him food too. Is the bond between the dog and the owner important? Absolutely. It's important to have a loving and, and strong bond with your pet, just as it is with any member of your family, for sure. Uh, that having been said, uh, we can teach dogs the first day we meet them. We don't have to have the bond to start forming the bond or to begin teaching them things. And I find uh, one of the best ways to form a strong bond is to become a, a, a good and uh, loving teacher to them. It tends to really help them uh, love and, and care about us. How should you start? I usually begin with food. You know, uh, get out some food. It might be their meal. It might be something special. And start rewarding and reinforcing behavior I like and conditioning emotions that I worry about. If a loud noise happens, I immediately feed them and let them know, hey, loud noises mean you get bacon. Loud noises mean you get Sam jerky. Hey, maybe loud noises aren't so bad. So a good place to begin is with food. Dogs tend to really like it and care about it. How long you should, should you train a dog one trick? I usually work for a couple minutes at a time. More than a couple minutes, both the dog and the human tend to get bored and sloppy. So two or three minutes at a time is about right for any one trick. How should you end each session? I try to end each session with something easy and that I can reinforce again and again. So we might be working on something complicated like spin or roll over or something like that. Uh, walk between our legs, but I'll, then I'll end the session with a couple quick sits, downs, and watch me so I can reward that and keep them feeling really happy and good about that session. Sometimes learning can be a little bit frustrating, so I always want to end with something easily, easily rewardable. What should the environment be like? Well, that's a really important question. Um, we want to begin with the environment being um, quiet and safe and easy, and then pretty quickly, though, begin practicing uh, in more difficult environments out in front of your house instead of behind your house, out in front of your house instead of inside your house, down the block, at the local park. Here I might, I often begin here in my uh, living room, we move to the backyard, we move to the front yard, we move down the block to the police station parking lot, over to the high school uh, as high school is getting out, and it's important to what we call generalize the behaviors, so otherwise dogs tend to do really well in your living room, and not able to function outside. So it's important to practice in a variety of places. But just as with humans, dogs don't learn well with a lot of distraction. Practice with distraction, but learn in a nice, quiet, calm environment. What should you bring when you train the dog? Well, the most important thing to bring is yourself and be thoughtful about what you're doing. Bring a plan. You know, I, I like to bring a plan and think, okay, today we're going to work on this or that. And we're going to work on it by doing this or that, and this is how we're going to do it. And then bring flexibility, because sometimes immediately it turns out, well, it's pretty obvious my dog doesn't want to do that today, or they're bored by that, or it's too distracting an environment to work on that, so instead we work on something easier. But the first, of all, first thing to do is to bring ourselves when we're calm, when we're easygoing, when we're feeling smart, and we're ready to work. Secondly, I like to bring some high-quality food and a variety of food. Dogs get bored with food the same as we do. Look, I like burritos. I like burritos more than I wish I did. I like breakfast burritos. I like lunch burritos. I like dinner burritos. But a couple of days of burritos, I'm ready to move on to something else. So dogs are the same way. They may love liver, but mixing liver with cheese and peanut butter and some other things and some egg dog food is always preferable. What are the best rewards to use? Well, praise is a great reward. Dogs love to hear that they're doing a good job. Affection, I don't find to be the best reward. I like to give my dogs affection just for no reason. They're, they're always going to get some good loving. There's no condition upon that. They're part of my family. They know it. We always love and, and take care of our family regardless. Um, but we don't necessarily praise behavior we don't like. Um, 
And, but the most effective reward for most dogs is food. Uh, some dogs, my Rottweiler here, he enjoys working uh, for play. So we'll do some, do a couple tricks and then play some tug and do a couple tricks and play a little chase. Uh, he chases me, not usually the other way around. Something like that. But day in and day out, food's going to be the most rewarding thing. How do you train to stop aggressive behavior in dogs? Well, we could spend hours talking about that. It's one of the most complex and challenging topics in dogdom today. But uh, let's just talk about one basic concept, and that is fearful aggression, which is by far the most common, or, or more accurately, we might call it fearful reactivity. And that's where uh, the dog is afraid and puts up a show to try and get whatever they're afraid of to leave their area. So I walk into a room, I'm a big scary guy, a dog doesn't know me, they're afraid to go, rah, 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 rah. it'd be easy to say, oh my gosh, that's an aggressive dog. More accurately though, if we uh, really identify and diagnose the issue correctly, that's a fearful dog. And to help them, first of all, we want to back off, not get in their face when they're feeling afraid, that's not going to help anything. Let them calm down, give them some time to, to be calm. And then reintroduce the triggers, whether it's a human or a dog or a bicycle or whatever it is. Reintroduce that trigger and pair it with something of very, very high value. So, for instance, Rudy used to be fearfully aggressive towards motorcycles. He'd see a motorcycle and it seemed like he wanted to chase after it and kill it. In fact, what he wanted to do was just get the motorcycle to leave. So, right from the beginning, we started feeding him bacon as soon as he saw a motorcycle. So now when he sees a motorcycle, he's not fearful or aggressive. He just sits and looks at me and goes, motorcycle, do I get something good to eat? All that motorcycles mean to him is that they're a predictor of something good. We call them the harbinger of bacon. They're the predictor of something good, so they bring anticipatory uh, pleasure and joy instead of uh, dread or anxiety. So uh, to work with fearful aggression, we recognize that it, the fear is real to them, and then we pair the trigger that they're afraid of with something good in small doses a little bit at a time. This is called Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, because Pavlov's the one that figured it out. Ivan Pavlov, he won a Nobel Prize for his work in this area, not just for this, but in his work in this area. He's a really smart guy, and this is the way to do it. How do you teach a dog a complex behavior other than come, sit, etc.? Well, usually we want to break it down into little steps. So, for instance, if I wanted to teach my dog Rudy to roll over on his back um, and hold his position there, in order for me to, uh, by me doing, um, let's say I wanted to use a funny hand signal like this. Let's say I wanted to do this and he'd roll over on his back. Well, I'd begin by teaching him to roll on his back by luring him with a little food lure. I'd want to make sure that he was in a safe and um, comfortable environment to do that. For instance, this floor has uh, foam tiles on it, so this is a pretty good place for him to roll around. He's going to feel comfortable. He's not wearing a harness that's going to dig into him. So I'd begin by luring him like that. Once I could get him to do that, then as I lured him into it, I'd start doing this. So I'm luring him while doing this, and then as he gets into that position, give him the food. Before long, I can just do this, and he'll roll. Let's see if it works. Hey, Rudy. <laughs> Let's go, bud. Is your bed in the way? Come here. Come on. Rudy. Oh, yeah, that's the way. Good boy. How do you reduce separation anxiety in a dog? This is one of the most challenging and difficult things to work with with dogs. And um, I highly recommend, if you're having this issue, to go online and look at a website by a woman named Melina Martini. It's Melina, and then her last name is De Martini. that's D-E Martini. She is the leader in this field, and I think that the work that she's doing is the best and most important that we have. I'm going to do a very quick little synopsis of her recommendations, and that is to break it down into little tiny elements. So don't try to leave your dog alone for a day and hope it gets better. Leave your dog alone for 5 seconds, for 10 seconds, for 20 seconds. Build up very slowly, in and out, in and out, in and out. And each time as you're leaving, toss behind you a very high-value food morsel. So as you're leaving, toss behind bacon, come back in 5 seconds. Our goal is to actually come back at first before they're even done eating. A lot of times they won't even eat it if they're stressed out enough. They won't eat it while we're gone. So that's okay. Toss the food, leave, come back in five seconds, come back in 10 seconds. 
over time, we hope that they will start to make those associations that, hey, you know, even though I'm not comfortable eating it until they come back, it is in fact them leaving that I'm associating with the wonderful thing. Break it up in little sessions and make sure that nothing bad happens while you're gone. It can also be very useful to do humane, slow, quiet crate training. A lot of times dogs are a lot more comfortable in their crate than they are loose in the house. That's not always true. It's a good place to start. How do you train a dog not to jump up on people? Well, rather than train a dog not to jump up on people, what I try to do is to make sure they're not rewarded for jumping up on people. That means if ever they do jump up on somebody, I ask the person to turn around, walk away, and leave the room. So if a dog jumps on me, if I'm fostering a dog, or I adopt a new dog, or I'm training a dog here at my house, they jump on me, I immediately leave the room and close the door. I go into my hall, into the closet, and close the door. Into the bathroom, close the door. Into my bedroom, close the door. That's the opposite of what they want. I'm not directly punishing them, I'm just removing myself. I'm removing the thing that they want the most. So that they learn that, well, jumping up's not working. Then I also practice sitting and staying, laying down and staying, sitting and waiting, laying down and waiting, over and over and over and over. So they have a very strong history of reinforcement for keeping four paws on the ground, whether they're sitting or laying down or whatever. Rudy used to be terrible at jumping up on people. Now his natural reaction around people is to do this because this is what I've reinforced the most. I didn't say, no, no, get down for jumping on me. I said, yes, yes, lay down or sit and reward this, and now that's what he does. How do you train a dog to not bark a lot? Boy, that's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's pretty annoying when dogs bark all the time, and this little guy, Buster, he still barks quite a bit more than I wish that he did. We're always going to be working on that with him. Dogs tend to bark for two big reasons. There's other reasons, but two main big fields of reasons. Is One is when they bark at us, we call that a demand bark. They're demanding that we do something for them. Feed me, feed me, let me out, let me in. When dogs bark at us like that, as long as we're sure they're not actually in real distress, it's just I want a treat or whatever, turn around and leave the room. Bark at me, I leave. There's no reward in it for you if you bark at me. In fact, all that's going to happen is you're going to cause me to leave your presence. That's how you diminish the barking, but to make that be permanent, dogs have to have some way of asking for things or they'll find their own way. They'll start doing other stuff that you don't like. So we may end the barking, but they'll start pawing at you or biting at you or knocking stuff off the counter to get attention or whatever it is. So we also have to work on 50 sits a day or 50 repetitions of some behavior, some combination of sit, down, wait, stay, reward, 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 so that when our dogs want something from us, their natural course of action is not to demand, 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 bark, 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 but maybe they follow us around sitting. It can be a little annoying too, but it's way better than barking. And that's, that's what I find that my dogs do. Right now it's about dinner time, so they're all just hanging out looking at me. They know that if they barked, I would just leave. But they're ready for dinner, so you know they're doing whatever tricks they can think. Look how well I'm settling down and staying here for you. Let's go. Okay, we're almost done. We're going to have dinner soon. Does walking a dog once or twice a day help in training a dog? Um, usually, yeah, but some dogs are really stressed out by the walk. If they're really afraid or they're really stressed out, walking is probably not going to help. So we have to deal with their anxiety at the same time. Teach them to walk on a loose leash. Um, I find that a lot of people have the misconception that a tired dog is a good dog. A tired dog is a tired dog, but just like with humans, they don't always make the best decisions when they're really tired. So works both ways. Um, but uh, dogs definitely do need to be walked. They need to have the chance to explore their territory and they need males and females like to sniff and then mark. And I encourage people to do, let them do that. Uh, not everywhere that they want to. Don't let them make your neighbors mad by peeing on their favorite prized rose bushes and stuff. But pick a spot each block, a telephone pole, a fire hydrant, a, a, you know, a, a yard where you think it's appropriate and say, sure, you can sniff and pee here. Here in our neighborhood, right over there, kitty corner from our house, there's what we call the Facebook bush. I watch dogs all day. Whenever I'm out, there's dogs over there sniffing and peeing on it. It's a lot of information to be shared. It's not about uh, an adversarial thing. It doesn't mean that they're mad at each other. It doesn't mean that they're dominant or any of that kind of nonsense. It just means they're sharing information. Wow, Charlie around the corner is kind of sick this week, you know? <laughs> it's just, wow. Whatever information they're sharing, 
They're sharing it. It's important to them to let them do it. So I encourage you to let them sniff and pee in an appropriate way. Then, in addition to the Facebook bush, we have all these little places around. We say, oh, well, you know, Buster's checking his pee mail. Let them do it. Let them have a little sniff and pee. And take them for walks, for sure. They're, they're both, you know, it's all important, yes. But don't get into this idea that I'll just walk the bad behavior out of them. That's, that's a myth. So... Does dog, walking a dog once or twice a day help training a dog? Yes, provided that it's a productive walk that the dog enjoys and that you enjoy, and it's not just a stressful uh, uh, pull-a-thon. Uh, it's really a privilege to answer these questions for you all today. I hope that it's been helpful.